Hi, my name is John Lee Brook, and I'm the author of a new book that'll be coming out in June 2015. The title of the book is Blood and Death, The Secret History of Santa Muerte and the Mexican Drug Cartels. And it's kind of an introduction, a teaser, to get you to buy this book. I'm going to give you a little bit of the history of the drug cartels in Mexico and how they came into existence. There are 10 southern states in the country of Mexico. Yucatan and Quintana Roo, two of those 10, profit from tourism, while the rest of the southern states, because of vast tracts of arable land, depend upon agriculture for their economic health. For the most part, the people of this region are hardworking and poor, despite the fact that they live on some of the most fertile land in the world. Corn is the primary crop grown in the drier regions. The regions with more water grow avocados, citrus fruits, coffee, and melons. In the years leading up to World War I, enterprising individuals in the southern states of Mexico recognized a simple economic truth. They could make more money growing a more desirable crop. Now that crop was marijuana. Marijuana originated in Southern and Central Asia. It arrived in North America with the influx of Chinese migrant workers who were hired by the railroad companies as common laborers. The workers not only brought marijuana with them, but opium too. Like most immigrants, the Chinese established enclaves. These were cities within the city in which they resided. These enclaves were called Chinatowns. Each Chinatown had its own rules, customs, and system of government. Outsiders would travel to Chinatown in their area to obtain opium. And once there, these visiting outsiders would often be introduced to marijuana, which was readily available. At first, Marijuana was not popular with Americans because they preferred opium. Besides, marijuana had a bad reputation. Supposedly, it made people who used it lazy. And this reputation, this lazy reputation, resulted in certain parts of Canada and the United States passing laws restricting its use. However, these laws were not rigidly enforced. In fact, for the most part, the authorities simply looked the other way. Then, in 1875, opium was outlawed in San Francisco for its corrupting influence. Among non-white ethnic groups, the use of marijuana became more and more popular. Mexican immigrants fleeing the Mexican Revolution entered the United States, bringing their habitual use of marijuana with them. And of course, the Chinese immigrants used marijuana extensively, as did many African Americans in the southern cities of the United States. To most Americans, though, marijuana use was indicative of the lower classes during this time period. Then, during the Great Depression, Herbert Hoover established the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, which later became the Drug Enforcement Agency. So-called recreational drugs were becoming more of a problem. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics was Hoover's response to what he believed to be an insidious disaster looming just over the horizon. The director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics was a man named Harry Anslinger, who was a hardcore reactionary. Anslinger ran the Bureau with an iron fist and wanted draconian laws enacted against drug users. To this end, Anslinger supported a bill called the Marijuana Tax Act. The bill imposed a tax 
on the sale of marijuana. Violation of the law carried a fine of $2,000 or five years in prison. And back then, $2,000 was a lot of money. Legal sale or possession of marijuana required the purchase of a marijuana tax stamp from the state government. Purchasing a tax stamp was almost next to impossible. Anyone who made an application for a tax stamp was viewed as a potential criminal and usually underwent criminal investigation.